This happened when I was around three possibly four since it was in the summer. My parents and I had just moved into a new house in a safer neighborhood in order to raise me. Basically they were looking for new 60s themed furniture for our house so like any other person at the time, my mother took to Craigslist to try and find some. She eventually reached out to a man selling an older couch. She had just taken me out of preschool before going to his house so I was in the car with her. My mother is generally a very intelligent woman, although I'll admit being a first-time mother this wasn't the best idea. She had left me in the car because she didn't think it would take too long. He was standing outside of the house and according to her seemed like a completely average man probably in his late forties. He claimed the couch was in the basement and they would have to go down there. Apparently the couch was completely different than the one placed in the ad so she turned around to ask him about it. He was sweating out of his mind and apparently started asking her a bunch of creepy questions along the line of, are you a virgin, and how old are you? And, are you married? My mother left quickly and claims he chased after her. She drove off as quickly as possible and to this day she says that she thought he was going to hit her over the head and sell her or something along those lines. Okay, so, I've posted to this channel before and I was just thinking about creepy encounters I'd had, and it struck me that this one probably qualifies as kind of creepy. Hopefully I'm right. This happened about a year ago now. I am a college student and I was basically forced to move out on my own, which I didn't mind, but that meant finding a new roommate which can be a daunting and scary experience. I've had a few weird encounters but I think this one takes the cake. I posted on Craigslist looking for a bedroom in a shared house or apartment for $300 or less, and on my ad I mentioned, please no phone calls, only texts or email, because I find being on the phone with someone I haven't had a chance to size up a really uncomfortable situation. I'm just awkward I guess. Anyway, I got a call from a dude who clearly didn't read the no calls part, which I mentioned because this type of phone call was exactly the reason I don't like to talk to strangers on the phone. At first he was just pleasant and normal, told me he had a room available and relevant information like that. We started to talk about when and where we'd meet and he started going on tangents about random stuff. I'm a combination of too interested in deep conversation and too awkward to end the call when it started to get weird, so this call went on for two hours and we talked about the meaning of life and all kinds of weird things like that. Honestly this should have been a red flag, and I shouldn't have met him and of course I also should have grown a pair and told him I needed to leave. So, he wants me to meet him at his place and show me the room. I've since learned that you should really insist on meeting in public first. I got to his neighborhood and it was run down on a level that made the ghetto I grew up in look nice. Saggy front porches, hot cracked concrete, sad people with old beat up Lincolns. You get the picture. His house blended right in. The yard was seriously overgrown and the front door didn't work. So I went around the back and just looking at the guy standing in the doorway, and seeing the kitchen behind him, was enough to make me realize I really just wanted to leave. No way in hell. The guy in the doorway was a man with a sort of clown style afro. He was leaning on a cane on his right side, his eyes looked crazy and the house smelled musty from ten feet away. Again I'm a coward so instead of trusting my gut, I go inside and I'm polite thinking, it's okay, it'll be over in twenty minutes and I can get the EFF out, I don't know what made me think this man who had a two hour conversation with me on the phone about life and philosophy would let me get away that easily. He took me up a flight of creaky steps into a small bedroom with no door and a mattress on the floor. I thought no way in hell would I live with a forty-something man, I was nineteen and female, and no door in my bedroom, but it was a moot point because my mind was made up before I even saw the room. I wouldn't have lived there for free, let alone for two hundred dollars a month. Things got weird. He tried to hold me hostage with conversation again. I think he was lonely. He talked about how some of his family were millionaires. He might have been delusional, the whole story seemed made up. Then he told me about an 18-year-old girl that has also checked out the room and tried to fuck him, and told me about how his mom hated white people, he was black, 
I was white, and it sounded like he sympathized with her. Obviously that was super uncomfortable. Eventually I was able to find a break in conversation and plucked up the courage to make up an excuse to leave. I was never so happy to leave a place in my life. I don't know that he was necessarily a rapist or anything but he really gave me the fucking creeps. That was probably the weirdest Craigslist experience. It all started with a Craigslist ad. I had just moved into a new apartment and being the broke postgrad that I am, I had pretty much nothing to my name except a few boxes of stuff from my parents' house and a busted up box spring mattress. At that point, most days, I was sitting cross-legged on the floor in the living room eating off paper plates while binging Netflix from my laptop for hours at a time. Clearly, this was no way to live and so I decided to log on to my neighbor's unprotected Wi-Fi network and hunt for some furniture, so I could at least binge Netflix from the comfort of a couch and stop eating on the floor like a savage. And so I hopped onto the free section of Craigslist and began searching for a couch. Have you ever searched for a couch on Craigslist? It's not great. Half the couches on there are held together with duct tape and the other half are covered in stains of dubious origin. I may be broke as hell, but I'm not that broke. I have standards. I had to have been scrolling for well over an hour and was probably already a week into the backlogs. I was going to quit, but decided to give the page a refresh before calling it a day. And the moment I refreshed, it caught my eye. The ad was right at the top, not even a minute old, listed as, brand new couch never used free for pickup. Brand new sounded pretty good to me, so I went ahead and opened it. The couch was in perfect condition. Almost suspiciously perfect, but there were no stains, no lumps, no broken legs. I wasn't one to look a gift horse in the mouth, so I typed out a quick response that I'd be willing to take it off their hands and then prayed that no one had beaten me to the punch. I got a response less than five minutes later. Yeah, the couch is all yours if you can come by to pick it up today. I'm available until 8 o'clock, so be sure to get out here by then. You might want to leave soon. I was slightly confused by that last part until I saw the address. This place was way out in the boonies. Way far. Nestled in the part of the country reserved for mountain men and hillbillies. I was hesitant. It was a long drive. To the back country. Where no one can hear you scream. But as I sat there in my sparse living room, on the bare floor, I realized that I really needed that couch. And it was probably safe. People almost always walk away from Craigslist deals alive. Usually. It was a stupid thing to do, but I did it anyways. I typed out another quick reply that I'd be heading out right away and thanked them for the couch. Then I grabbed my keys and bolted out the door and hopped in my truck. I plugged the address into Google Maps and was on my way. As I drove down the interstate, I began to appreciate just how far I was going to get one piece of furniture. The cityscape soon gave way to suburban housing developments and those developments soon gave way to the vast brush of the middle of nowhere. I never really understood why people would want to be so far removed from society, but to each their own, I guess. I had been driving through mountains and valleys for the better part of an hour when Google Maps finally spoke up. In 500 feet, take exit 23 for Arbor Road. I sighed in relief. I was getting closer. As I got off the freeway, Google chimed in again. Take the next right on Arbor Road. I made my way deeper and deeper into the countryside. Giant oaks leaned over stretches of road and every so often a squirrel would tempt fate and dash across the road in front of me. It was deserted. I don't think I saw another car since I had gotten off the freeway. In 200 feet, take the next left onto Gable Lane. I jumped a little when Google broke the silence, but quickly regained my senses and slowed down to take the left. Turn left onto Gable Lane. But I couldn't see it. There didn't seem to be any road at all, just woods and brush. I stopped in the middle of the road. I could see the path on the map. There should be a road. 
I pulled my car forward, slowly, searching for the street that should be there. And then I saw it. Just barely. It's like the woods were trying to hide it. It was almost completely overgrown on the sides. Brush piled high on both sides, spilling out onto the asphalt. The sign was literally being swallowed up by a tree. The words, Abel Lawn, poked out from beneath the bark. I'll be honest, I nearly turned around right there. This is the part of the horror movie where you yell at the idiot college kids to turn around and spend spring break in Cabo like everyone else. But I had been driving for forever and turning around would have meant wasting the afternoon and about a half tank of gas. I'm frugal, if a little stupid. So I took the left and pushed past the overgrown brush onto Gable Lane. From there, it wasn't as spooky as you'd think from the creepy entrance. Gable Lane opened up once again into a proper road and I was on my way once more. And then ten minutes later, the road stopped. Or rather, the asphalt did. Big clouds of dust filled the air as my truck hit a dirt road. I did a quick check of my map to be sure I hadn't taken a wrong turn. But the app confirmed I was going in the right direction. I drove down the dirt road for a good five minutes when Google Maps chimed in again. In half a mile, take a right at the gnarled oak tree. That was odd. Since when did Google Maps start giving directions like a clerk at a liquor store? Does Google Maps even use landmarks in their directions? But sure enough, a half mile down the road, a huge oak tree stood, old and twisted, half of its leaves missing. And at its base was another dirt road, much less traveled, nearly overrun with tall grass. I took the turn and continued down the road. The next 15 minutes was a rabbit trail of different roads and landmarks that took me deeper and deeper into the woods. Turn left at the pile of rocks. Turn left at the broken down tractor. Turn right into the grove of trees. I had nearly reached my breaking point, which I admit, I probably should have reached far sooner, when the road in front of me stopped dead. There was no asphalt, no dirt, just a wall of trees and bushes. I couldn't drive any farther. I was pissed. Google had screwed up. It took me on a wild goose chase through the middle of nowhere, likely way far away from my destination and now some other lucky bastard was going to get my free couch. Take the wooden footpath ahead for 100 yards. I snapped out of my anger. What did it just say? I looked at my phone. The instructions had turned from car directions to walking directions, the little walking man icon now highlighted on the screen. I looked up and through the glare on my windshield I could see it. Straight ahead, there was a small break in the bushes, behind which I could see a series of wooden logs half buried in the dirt, forming a path through the trees. Again, had I made more sense, I would have turned back then. But I'm nothing if not persistent, so instead I climbed out of my truck, locked it and headed through the trees and down the path. The path wound up and down the hillside, through the trees, around prickly bushes and soon my truck was out of sight. It started to occur to me that even if I found the house and got the couch, I was going to have to lug it all the way back to the truck. That was going to be a gigantic pain in the ass. I could only hope the couch giver would lend me a hand. I was pretty far down the path when Google spoke again. After the bend, take a left along the river bank. I could hear the water before I saw it. As I rounded the bend, a large, rushing river came into view. I didn't look deep, but it didn't look exactly safe to cross. I was glad Google wasn't asking me to ford it. I did as instructed and took a left alongside the river. Google chimed in almost immediately. In 200 feet, take the fallen tree over the river. Of course. Of course I was going to have to cross the damn river. It wasn't long before I saw the tree. It was huge and long dead, devoid of any leaves and dry as a bone. It lay across the river, resting on either side of the bank. The river ran below it, a bit calmer than when I first saw it, but I still wasn't keen on falling in. Take the fallen tree over the river. I took a deep breath, scrambled over the roots and hoisted myself up onto the dead tree. 
why the hell not? I'd come this far. Even if there was no couch at the end of this, I'd at least have a fun story to tell. It was a slightly scary trip across the dead tree. I was certain at some point my foot would break through a rotten patch and I'd turn my ankle or go sprawling into the water below. But aside from a few worrying creaks and cracks, I got to the other end with no problem. Google had started talking again before my feet even touched the ground on the other side. Take the path in the thicket ahead for 400 yards. All right, Google, you're the boss. I proceeded through the thicket ahead, almost enjoying myself at that point. I was bushwhacking, like some old school adventurer. Except the hidden treasure I was seeking was a sofa instead of the holy grail. Along the way, Google kept feeding me instructions. Take a right around the large boulder. Take the embankment upward to your left. Keep straight past the hornet's nest. In 50 feet, take a right past the rotten stump. Looking back, the directions were impossible. How the hell would Google know that a hornet's nest would be on that tree? There's no way they were sending people down here to plot directions to some redneck's house in the butt crack of nowhere. But I was tired and stubborn and at the moment, it barely registered. I know what you're thinking. I am not a smart man. You're not wrong. I had just finished wading through a sea of bushes when I came into what I can only describe as a hollow. I don't know if that's the right word, but that's what I'm calling it. The forest cleared out in nearly a perfect circle, maybe 40 feet in every direction. The branches of the ancient trees joined together above me, shutting out the sun, casting the entire area in shadow. And in the middle of the hollow was a large, stony outcropping, jutting out of the ground like a broken molar. And in the middle of that outcropping was an opening. I stepped out into the hollow and could feel the temperature drop. I stopped dead. This wasn't right. I nearly jumped when Google spoke up. Enter the cave. And that was that. I was done. Like hell I was going into some creepy cave in the woods for a damned couch. I'll put up with a good amount of nonsense, but I have my limits. I turned to leave, hoping I could get back to my car and the main road before the sun went down. Google piped up again. Enter the cave. Yeah, no thanks. I stepped towards the exit of the hollow and hadn't even gone two steps before it interjected once more. The way back is closed. Enter the cave. What do you mean, the way back is closed? I shouted at my phone. I'm going back to my truck. You do not know how to get back. You will get lost. I stopped dead and chills went down my spine. I stared at my phone for a few seconds before raising it up to my mouth. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. I was on the verge of pissing my pants. I could feel myself begin to shake. I clenched my fists, took a few deep breaths before the panic could overtake me. I steeled myself and shouted back at my phone. I'm not going into that friggin' cave. I'm going back to the truck. You do not know the way back. And then the fear gave way to anger. I was fully prepared to get into an argument with my phone right then and there when I realized it was right. Google must have given me 20 different directions since I left my car and they were all basically down unmarked paths. There was no way I could find my way back without Google and Google was not going to help me. If I tried to find my way, I'd be stuck in deliverance country in the middle of the night, alone. I considered phoning for help, but my reception was dead, the bars replaced with a big fat circle with a slash through it. Enter the cave. I clenched my jaw. I didn't have much of a choice. I was basically hosed no matter what I chose to do. I turned around, looking into the mouth of the cave. It was pitch black, a gaping maw in the middle of the rock. And that's where I had to go. I approached it, slowly, carefully, as if the entrance were a wild animal waiting to swallow me whole. As I reached the entrance, I could smell the fetid aroma of damp, dead leaves. The air around the entrance was even colder than the air at the beginning of the hollow. 
the chilling air wrapped around my chest, almost as if it meant to grab me and drag me into the depths. I looked down at the shining light of my phone screen. Google spoke once more. Enter the cave. I took a deep, shuddering breath, closed my eyes and with all the courage I could muster, I stepped into the cave. Amanda is my brother's girlfriend. At the time of this story, she was looking for her first apartment and moving out from her parents' house. Her and my brother didn't want to move in together since they had only dated for a few months. She opted instead to search for a roommate online. Browsing Craigslist, she found an ad titled something like, Roommate Wanted, Females Only. This sort of thing was common since the area she was looking in was mostly young professionals. The listing was for a room in a house for about $225 a month, which was quite cheap compared to most places listed. The occupant listed herself as a 23-year-old college student that wasn't comfortable with living with any males. The other roommate would have their own room and attached bathroom. So far, Amanda was into this place. However, the listing only had a single photo from outside the property. Amanda sent an email wanting to meet the occupant and tour the house. Within 30 minutes, she receives an email back with all the details and time to stop by. The girl worked late hours and wanted Amanda to stop by at 8 p.m. When Amanda arrives, there is a handwritten note on the front door saying, door broken, use back door. Walking around the house, it looks nice but slightly unkempt, tall grass, weeds, dusty windows, etc. Still no alarms for Amanda though. When she knocks on the back door and an older man opens the door. At first Amanda thinks she has the wrong house but the man reassures her and says that the occupant, I forget the name, was out and he was the landlord. The occupant asked him to meet Amanda since she was working late. He seemed pleasant and offered to show her around. Alarms start going off but aren't at red alert yet. First, the guy was clearly in his forties, unshaven, and looked like he lived in his car. Also, only the kitchen light was on. As they walked around the house, Amanda noticed one huge red flag, no furniture. Nothing. The landlord was polite about answering questions but seemed irritable at keeping the lights on for too long, rushing her around and only letting her look at rooms for a few moments. There was a single room that the landlord wouldn't open, telling her that it was the occupant's room and he didn't want to invade her privacy. As they walk down the hallway into the living room, she notices the front door has a plank nailed across it. Broken, for sure. Amanda's creepometer is starting to die so she decides to wrap up the walkthrough and leave but trying to be polite. As she's giving the guy her, thanks for the showing, bit, he perks up and states that he forgot to show her the basement. It's recently furnished and would be a great rec room, and she should take a look down there. At the time, Amanda and the landlord are standing in the small hallway between the front living room and the back kitchen. In this little hallway was the basement door. When he opens the door, it opens outward to create something of a barrier between Amanda and the back door. The basement is pitch black. He smiles, motions down the stairs, and says, ladies first. What happens next is nothing more than a stroke of luck. Amanda gets a text just as some random person parks in front of the house. Thinking on her feet, she pretends it's a phone call and answers her phone. Hey. Yeah, are you here? I'll come out from around back and let you in. It's great, you have to see it. With a motion of confidence, she excuses herself around the landlord and walks out of the back door. She says the guy just looked at her like he was confused. Once outside, she sprinted to her car and sped like hell out of there. When Amanda got home, she told her mother and my brother everything. Cops were called, they took her statement, and went to investigate. The Craigslist post had been removed. Epilogue The house had been foreclosed over six months earlier and the property had been abandoned. When the police investigated, they found that the closed room the landlord didn't want her to look in was where the man had been staying. There was a pile of old dirty blankets, rotten food, 
and empty gallon jugs everywhere. More creepy was he had plastered ripped up pages from porno mags on all the walls in the room, where do they even find porno mags? The really scary part of this was the basement. The man had tied a thin piece of fishing twine at about shin level across the stairs about halfway down. The basement was empty except another pile of old blankets, a broom handle wrapped in leather belts, and a small box with a few rolls of assorted tape, duct, electric, etc. Amanda ended up not moving in. I sat in my room, alone and a little sleepy. It was about 1 a.m., and it was snowing outside. I sat there playing the recently released Bioshock Infinite. I had no light on in my room, I enjoyed playing in the dark. It makes me feel as if I am in the game. Anyway, I was sitting up in my bed, resting against the headboard. My room was about 20 by 18 feet and I had my bed, a nightstand, a 32-inch flat-screen TV, a dresser, and a closet. My room had two windows, on either side of the bed, but I had blackout shades on them so I could sleep better. My nightstand was to the right of the bed and the TV was directly across from my bed on top of the dresser. To the left of the dresser was the closet, and to the right of the dresser was the door. I was living the life. I was in my mid-twenties, a bachelor, and an apartment all to myself. The only other person that shares the apartment with me is my pit bull, Butch. He looks frightening from afar, but he could never hurt a fly. His name doesn't really suit him too well, but alas he's a loyal dog. His dog bed was to the left of my bed, and it faced the door. He laid there in a deep sleep, and he was snoring. His snoring was like the sound of a train going right through my bedroom. I have contemplated kicking him out and making him sleep in the living room more than once. He suddenly awoke, and sat straight up. He started barking, and that was when I could hear the sound of someone at the front door. It seemed like they were trying to break in, so I rushed into the hallway and then into the living room. The doorknob was shaking violently. I slowly approached the door and looked through the peephole. It was my crazy ex-girlfriend. Jane was the type of girl who would become attached to anything or anyone that paid attention to her. She grew up with no father, as he left when she was young. So, she naturally attaches more to males. She looks for someone who could fit that father role or a man who can care for her. She had long blonde hair that went down to her big breasts. She had a kind face, with nice blue eyes. She had a fit body and was about five foot six. She was the type of girl who would always wear yoga pants and a tank top. I never complained, a girlfriend who wore yoga pants every day is some guy's dream come true. But, where she excelled in beauty, she lacked in being healthy mentally. She would always act like a child, and hold on to your hand everywhere, even when we were alone. She would laugh at everything I said, and that got super annoying. She would also ask me to marry her every single day since we started dating. She was crazy. These visits are pretty often since the day we broke up. The day we broke up she told me that she would never find someone else. I had to change the locks because she kept the keys and would walk into my room and watch me sleep at night. This visit was strange though because she would always come around dinner time since I changed the locks. It was 1am, what was she doing? I made the mistake of grabbing the door knob. She then stopped trying to get in and yelled, KC, I know you're in there. Open up. Shit, now what was I supposed to do? I unlocked the three locks I had on the door and opened the door. She stood there smiling, hey honey. She strutted right in like she owned the place and sat down on the couch in my living room. So what's my love up to tonight, she asked. Just playing Bioshock, why are you here? Something was off about her tonight, she wasn't wearing her normal yoga pants and a tank top. She was wearing grey jeans and a black sweatshirt. 
I'm here to see you my love, she said, smiling. I hate when she calls me her, love. I had made the mistake of saying, I love you, about two weeks before we broke up. I then spoke up, no seriously, why are you here? She suddenly stopped smiling and looked angry. I'm here to make you love me, and marry me. I suddenly had a bolt of rage flow through me. What? You know that will never happen. I will never love you. I screamed it at her. That cut deep into Jane, she sunk down into the couch. She then got up and pouted as she was walking towards my kitchen. Where do you think you're going? I'm going to grab something to eat. I decided to follow her into the kitchen, I did not trust her. As I entered the kitchen I saw her reach for my set of knives. Jane, what are you doing? She turned around with a butcher knife in her hand. You said you loved me. Why don't you love me? She lunged forward with the knife just scratching my forearm. I ran out into the living room. I know you're mad, but you don't need to do this, I said. She slowly walked towards me, her hands were shaking. You said you loved me, you lied. She ran at me, holding up the knife in her right hand. The living room was quite big and open, so when her arm extended towards me, I ran to the left of her. I rushed into my room, Butch had gone back to sleeping. He must have thought the visitor was not dangerous since I opened the door. Boy, was he wrong. I ran into my bedroom, looking for any object to defend myself with. I found a pocket knife that I stored in the drawer of my nightstand, just in case of burglars. Butch awoke and started barking. I turned around to see Jane standing in the doorway. You lied. She kept repeating those two words over and over again. I held up the pocket knife in my right hand, so she could clearly see it. What do you think you're going to do with that, she laughed wickedly. You're going to love me, even if I have to kill you, she said as she slowly approached me. Her logic made no sense to me, if she loved me so much why would she kill me? She lunged at me screaming, you lied, and as she lunged, I struck her in the chest with the pocket knife. I stabbed her right in the heart, and she fell to the ground. Laying on the ground, she looked at the wound and then back at me. She slowly whispered, why, and I looked her directly in the eye and said, I never loved you. She then took her last breath, and died right next to my bed. A pool of blood sunk into the white carpet beneath her. I dragged her to the closet and stuffed her in it. I closed the door to the closet. I had a lump in my throat, I had just killed someone. How am I going to sleep at night from now on? I turned and walked towards my bed. That's when I heard the closet door open. I turned around to see Jane standing there. You lied. She then lunged towards me with the butcher knife still in her hand. I woke up sweating and breathing heavily. It was just a dream. I kept telling myself that, trying to calm my nerves. I started breathing normally again and I looked around to see if it was really a dream. I looked on the carpet at the place where Jane used to lay. No blood in sight, I then walked towards the closet and opened the door to find no sight of Jane. I walked towards my bed and settled in, and started to sleep. That's when I heard it. I heard the sound of the front door knob rattling. Hello everyone. I had to get my story out here, as I have no other way to vent my anger and frustration. So I wanted to tell it on this channel. A year and a half ago, I started dating a great guy named Jeff. He was funny, sweet, and perfect for me at the time. Then a few months ago, I decided I didn't really want to be in the relationship anymore. I didn't have a finite reason why, I just didn't feel happy. For about a week we went back and forth on whether we should really break up, or just try harder. Eventually he persuaded me to stay in the relationship, a major mistake on my part. Now Jeff, as I said, was perfect. He texted me frequently, but not too much. He called me at night, but didn't ramble on for hours. But after I tried to break up with him the first time, he changed. 
he began texting me constantly, freaking out if I didn't reply within a minute or two. He would call me in the morning when he woke up, during the afternoon, and about three times at night. If I didn't pick up, he would contentiously call me and leave voicemails until I answered. Once I feel asleep and he called me 21 times in a half an hour span until I woke up. He also started to get very mean to me. He would tell me I'm lazy, and needed to start working out, or I was going to get fat. When I got upset he would apologize, and tell me he still loved me the way I was. But he would just start up again anyway. He would begin to yell at me for being a spoiled brat because my parents were helping me pay for tuition, not much, but they were still helping nonetheless. Eventually I just got tired of it all. I called him up and told him it was over. And that's when it all went downhill. I stopped replying to his texts, and had to block him on Facebook. I thought it would all just go away eventually, but then it got much much worse. One day all the contacts from my phone disappeared for no reason. A random number texted me, claiming to be my friend Mike. I had no reason to doubt, until the text started getting weird. All he wanted to talk about was Jeff, how I felt, if we were ever getting back together, that sort of thing. And then, I suddenly got a text from a different number, the real Mike. It had been Jeff texting me all along. Let me point out that the number was not Jeff's normal number either. I had that one memorized. As I'm freaking out about this, I suddenly hear a strange noise coming from my phone. It had been happening for the past several nights, I would hear a pinging noise, even when my phone was on silent, but there would be notification, nothing. It clicked then, that this was someone trying to locate my phone. I called Jeff, who admitted to doing just that, checking my location through my phone on a regular basis. I quickly changed my password, got a new number, and thought everything was done. Then today, I got an email from Amazon. It was an order confirmation for a pink, vibrating dildo. Huh. After checking the address it was being sent to, and seeing it was my house, I realized it must be Jeff, hacking into my accounts to screw with me. I have since filed a report with the police, and am now changing every password I have on any and every account online. I deleted my old Reddit account, and am scared to get a new one, so I will be using throwaways for the next 20 years. I don't know what else to do. It is driving me crazy, I haven't slept for weeks, and I have gotten more and more depressed as the days go on. The only positive thing to come out of all of this is that I now know the warning signs for a psychopath, and won't be making that mistake again. I once dated a stalker. However, what makes the story unusual is that she wasn't stalking me, although it ended up becoming my problem, as you'll see. Even though I wasn't the victim of her stalking, I didn't necessarily have a great relationship with her, either. I met this girl, let's call her, Gracie, on a forum devoted to a video game we all loved. There were discussions about the game and some light roleplay. This was about a decade ago, and I was young, stupid, had some problems that lead to other poor decisions in my life, but that's another story entirely, and had just ended my first serious relationship, which do this ex's bipolar disorder, would have been an emotional roller coaster for anyone. Online, Gracie was as sweet as could be, and was especially sympathetic about what had happened in my last relationship, claiming she had just gotten out of a chaotic relationship herself. We talked a lot, and we, I thought, jokingly suggested getting together. Eventually, a major anime convention on the East Coast rolled around, and many members of the forum were attending, including myself, Gracie, and the other person in this story, who I'll call, Ron. I'd spoken to Ron a bit before the convention on the forum and AIM, the instant messenger of choice back then, and hadn't particularly liked him, but I didn't hate him either. He just seemed pretty standoffish and had a short temper. While he could be fun to talk to sometimes, I had to make sure to only talk about the sorts of things we would on the forum, as you never knew what would set him off, and some pretty random things did, like mentioning another forum I frequented, or other interests I had. The convention came, and Gracie, Ron, and I all met in person for the first time, as well as some other members of the forum. 
I was there with another group, including my best friend, and had stated beforehand I'd be spending most of my time with them, but that I'd try to hang out with them when I could for photo ops and the like, since we were all cosplaying characters from the game the forum was devoted to. However, upon meeting Gracie, she immediately latched onto me, going on about how I was much cuter than she expected, she had seen pics of me before, and that I was even sweeter in person than online. In hindsight, I can see she was playing on the vulnerabilities she knew I had, but at the time I was immediately smitten. As a result, I spent most of the convention with her, which didn't sit well with the group I had come with, and it took a long time and a lot of damage control to repair my relationships with them. I also spent a lot of time with Ron, who ended up being nastier in person than he was online, but for some reason Gracie adored him. Again, 2020's hindsight, I think she thought that by fawning over me, she'd make him jealous, but he wasn't interested in the first place so it didn't work, the fact that I was female might have also thrown him off to her intentions. Well, the weekend came to an end. Near the end of it, Ron was removed by security and banned from ever attending again after he beat the crap out of a girl who had tried to hug him, random hugging is a strange, not entirely welcome reality of anime conventions. She had declined to press charges since he had asked her not to hug him, so she took part of the blame. With Ron out of the way now, Gracie turned her focus entirely to me, or so I thought. By the end of the weekend, Gracie had declared herself my girlfriend. You know how people talk about, red flags. Gracie might as well have been a living red flag. She called the shots throughout our short relationship, and when I say that, I mean I literally had no say in anything. She told me what our relationship status was and when. She told me we were going out. Within days of that, she told me we were engaged. Because she lived in Ohio and I lived in Maine and she refused to move for me, and maybe she didn't realize just what a vulnerable, stupid doormat I was, she demanded I move to Ohio. I didn't move, but I had begun making plans to do so when she abruptly told me, this is all happening too fast. We're over. Well, no shit it was moving fast. In the span of a week we went from dating to engaged, and same-sex marriage wasn't even legal in either of our states at the time, let alone nationwide, and in less than two months it was over. It was a wild ride, to say the least, and although I was upset at first when it ended, when I was in a better place mentally and emotionally I was just immensely relieved to have her out of my life. Or so I thought. The sign of things to come was when Gracie admitted to me that the relationship with her girlfriend back home that she had claimed had ended badly actually hadn't ended at all, but she totally intended to break it off before I got to Ohio. Shortly after that was our breakup, and then I started to get messages and calls from Ron. Apparently, although Gracie was posting publicly everywhere on various social media about her relationship status with me, she was actually bombarding him with instant messages, texts, and phone calls, professing her love to him and promising that she would drop me in a hot minute if he gave the word. He repeatedly told her he wasn't interested, blocked her on AIM, blocked her number, and, obviously, left the forum. Ron messaged and called me to inform me of this. Although I told him repeatedly we'd already broken up, he seemed to believe Gracie's behavior was my fault, and that it was my job to rein her in. Although he never came out and told me so, I think Gracie was telling him lies about me, as I later found out he was trash-talking me elsewhere. Somehow, this convinced him that I was somehow responsible for Gracie's stalking, and that I could put the kibosh on it if I wanted to. I repeatedly told him we'd broken up, we weren't even speaking anymore, and if she was posing a serious problem, to call the cops. So here I am, with Gracie stalking Ron, Ron blaming me for the stalking while semi-stalking me, for one thing, I never have him my phone number, but he started calling me after I blocked him on AIM, and I have no idea how to get out of any of this. Gracie eventually moved to the state that Ron lived in, whether she dumped her girlfriend in Ohio, I don't know, and started running into him in public places. She followed him home and would try to visit, insisting that she wasn't pursuing him, they were just friends. He told her to fuck off in no uncertain terms, but undeterred, Gracie still kept coming to his house, sometimes when he wasn't there. 
and Ron was still somehow convinced this was all my fault so it was my responsibility to fix it. I changed my number eventually, as well as my online presence so that he wouldn't be able to find me on social media or the like. I really don't know how things ended with Ron and Gracie. As I said, I eventually, about two years later, found Ron Trash talking me elsewhere, but it was for reasons unrelated to Gracie, although he was saying things that weren't true and I am sure Gracie had told him. For two years this guy carried a grudge against me because of my brief association with a crazy girl who was fixated on him. About a decade later, I've seen no sign of Ron or Gracie anywhere online. I even went to the convention again the year after I met Gracie, and although I had some issues regarding another relationship while there, and yes, by then I had come to the conclusion the problems I was having with relationships were due to me and stopped dating, I never saw Ron, who was, as I said, banned for life, or Gracie, who lived in the area now in order to stalk Ron. So Ron, while I hope the stalking thing ended peacefully and nothing bad happened to you, and Gracie, let's not meet ever again. This may well be the worst way to tell your parents you're gay. Do not recommend it. My sophomore year of high school, I was on the cast and costume crew for our fall play. One of my castmates slash crewmates was a really, really cute guy his name was Mark, he always wore skinny jeans who I learned from a mutual friend was bisexual. So I started flirting with him, looking for opportunities to hang out, sending him memes that everything a closeted nerd could do. After three months of flirting, hanging out, and growing gradually more affectionate, I asked him out on the last day of our play. He said yes. The issue? My mother is a very conservative Christian, and although she was tolerant of gay people, I knew she'd never allow me to have a boyfriend while I lived with her, side note, I had four boyfriends while I lived with her. So we had to hide our relationship, which early on wasn't too bad. We'd go to the movies, or his house, and just hang out. But everything started going downhill the first time we had sex. He started getting really demanding about hanging out, and by, demanding about hanging out, I mean, he was never not horny and frustrated. I was cool with it at first, cause dot well, sex. But after a while, I was getting pissed about it. Working a relationship around my mom was difficult, and my generally a social nature was not at all enjoying having to leave the house so often. I tried to talk to Mark about it, and he seemed understanding dot for like a week. Then, he started getting nasty. He'd avoid me at school, only text me to insult me, and act insanely jealous of my friends. Eventually, I had enough and dumped him in July, after nine months. Over text. While I was in Florida. Look, I was 16. Fuck you. Anyway, he lost it. He blew up my phone daily for a week. Then he started acting normal, like we were friends. That lasted another month, and we got back to school, my junior year, his senior. Unfortunately, while we were dating, we had tried to coordinate our schedules. So and now we had April 7th classes with each other. At first, he seemed okay. Then he started staring at me. Then he started texting me again, sad messages. I figured he was done being a dick and started being nice to him again. Big ass mistake. He started getting attached again. He would try to integrate himself every time I went out with my friends. He would beg me to take him back. I would say no and explain, again, why we couldn't be together. Around October, he started getting bad. Like, 1am texts about swallowing a whole bottle of melatonin, bad. In hindsight, I should have gone to the authorities, but I was terrified that doing so would lead to my mom finding out. So I tried to handle it myself. Bad idea. He got worse. He'd threatened to kill himself regularly, and tried to turn my friends against me. The worst day thus far came when we were building our homecoming float for drama club. I was hanging out and casually flirt bantering with two of my male friends, Isaac and Caleb, who are both straight. Mark saw this, stood up from where he'd been painting, and walked out in a hurry. A few minutes later, 
a freshman girl walked in, asking me where Mark was going he said I'd know. I found out later he'd driven himself to the ER to get counseling. I was happy, thinking he'd get some help. But I had no damn clue how obsessed he was. I came home from rehearsal one day to find his car parked up my street, and Mark walking towards it from my house. My mom was on the porch, waving by to him, she thought we were just friends and loved him. Apparently, he'd been in the neighborhood and thought to drop by. Just for some background I am the eldest of seven boys. My youngest brothers were two years old and six months in the womb during this. My mom raised us, primarily, by herself, dad's a dirtbag, stepdad was deployed throughout this ordeal. She is an honest six feet tall, about half that wide, and can easily sling me across her shoulders, I'm six feet three inches and 180 pounds. She is also the best shot with a pistol I've ever seen, by far. Not someone Mark, 5 feet 4 inches and 120 pounds soaking wet, would want to tangle with, even while she was heavily pregnant. I told her we did hang out, just not as much. She accepted this, and we went about our days. For a week, everything was okay. And then. I came home from rehearsal. Mark's car was parked up the street again. And he was sitting on our porch with my mother, who had my baby brother on her lap. She saw me get out of the car and gave me a, come hither, crook of the finger. Slowly, I walked up to the porch. It turned out Mark had told her everything. Everything. Our whole relationship. But with me as the abuser and himself as the victim. She started to lay into me, then dismissed Mark, who went back to his car snickering. After she was done ranting, I calmly told her my side of the story. Fortunately, she believed me, but she was still pissed. So I was grounded. Which pales in comparison to what happened that night. Our house is old and crappy. The windows can easily be jiggered open from the outside, even when they're locked. Mark knew this, since I'd used it to my advantage many times when sneaking out. And mom's room, where she and my two-year-old brother sleep, is right across the hall from mine, facing the backyard. Mine faces the street. That night, I woke up around 2 a.m. because I was cold. After I got my glasses on, I saw why. My window was open. I whipped around, searching for whoever did it my bedroom door was open too. As I got up, I heard the sound of mom's bedroom door quietly closing. I raced as quietly as possible to the door, and I heard something that stopped my heart. A metallic click. Like a gun being cocked. I flew across the hall and threw mom's door open. The lights were on. Mark was crouched in the corner, a cleaver in hand. My brother was sound asleep. And mom? Mom was calmly sitting up in bed, glasses on, Harry Potter book in her lap, 10mm pistol in her hands, pointed directly at Mark, who was shaking and sobbing. She told him to shut up before he woke the baby, and directed me to call the cops so she could keep an eye on him. Mark was taken into custody, but Mom declined to press charges, we couldn't afford it, on the condition that Mark move out to Arizona with his dad, instead of staying in Missouri with his mom. Which he did, and from then I hardly saw him, unless he was snapchatting my friends begging to talk about me. Standard shit, you know. Mark, for your safety, let's not meet. This happened to me back in 2007. I was 9 years old and my brother was 14. My mom had sent us out of the house with about 30 bucks to go to a movie and maybe get a bite to eat afterwards. After watching the movie, it was getting pretty dark and I was ready to go home. But my brother wanted to get something to eat first, and we agreed to walk to Burger King which was only a couple blocks from the movie theater. On our way there, we were stopped and approached by a man. He had a friendly smile plastered on his face, 
and he was holding his child's hand. There didn't seem to be anything off about this man. He was average looking, and seemed to be nothing more than a father having a day out with his son. Hey, do you two think you could give my son and I a hand real quick? He asked. We need help loading a mattress onto the back of our truck. The truck is just up the road. Sorry, but we don't really have time, my brother said. It was at this time I noticed the little boy. He was about eight years old, and he looked abnormally thin. He had a blank expression on his face, and wore clothes that were much too big for him. I turned my attention back to the man, who was now mumbling to my brother about how it would only take a second. My brother kindly declined again. Being the helpful kid that I was, I joined in with the man and tried to persuade my brother that we should help them out. I turned to my brother, who was now staring down at the little boy. My brother had a disturbed expression on his face as he looked down at the child. The child stared back at my brother blankly. I didn't understand why my brother had that look on his face. He grabbed my hand, and said, I think that's my mom over there. He pulled me, and we began walking away from the man. I didn't understand what was going on, and why my brother had just lied about our mom being there. He didn't let go of my hand and practically dragged me until we were a far distance away from the man and his son. I looked back and could still see the man holding his son's hand. Only now, he wasn't smiling anymore. He had a look of fury on his face, and he yanked the little boy by the arm and they walked away. I pulled away from my brother's grasp, and bombarded him with questions. He shushed me, and pulled his cell phone out of his pocket. He dialed in a number and began pacing around nervously while talking on the phone. I remember the police showing up, and my mom came soon after. She took me home, but my brother was left with the police. I asked my mother what was going on, and she said that the police were just questioning my brother because the man we had encountered was dangerous. That's all she told me, and I went to bed. By the next morning, I had almost completely forgotten about the incident and things went back to normal. It wasn't until a few days ago that these memories flooded back into my mind. I decided to call my now 22-year-old brother to get some answers. When I brought the ordeal back up him, he finally gave me the information I wanted to know. And now that I know everything, I understand how fucking terrifying our encounter with the man truly was. My brother told me that while the man was constantly trying to convince us to come with him, he happened to look at the little boy. The little boy then looked at my brother with his eyes filled with terror and mouthed the words, I'm not his son. Please help me. Then his expression went back to being completely blank, almost as if he had never said anything at all. This was why he had become so freaked out and snatched me away. When he called the police, they hurried down and he described the man the best he could. They couldn't do much with the little information my brother had given, because we hadn't even seen the car that the man supposedly had. My brother told me that a few weeks into the investigation, they had found the little boy who was with the man dead. His body had been cruelly dumped in the woods. The cause of death was malnutrition and dehydration. If my brother and I had gone with the sicko, we likely would have met the same fate. He obviously couldn't have kidnapped both of us on his own, as my brother was a fairly strong fellow. That meant he had other pedophile partners who would help him snatch up unsuspecting kids. Unfortunately, they were never able to catch any of the sick fucks who did this to the child. But the man was definitely not his father. His real parents had already been searching for their missing son for almost a month. The pedophiles had managed to kidnap the poor kid, and used him as their puppet to try and kidnap other children. Every time I think about the boy, I feel a deep pity for him. He was only a year younger than I was at the time, and I can only imagine how terrible it must be to slowly starve to death. And to the disgusting bastard who starves and murders children, you'd better hope we never meet. I am 22 and this incident happened a year and a half ago. I had just moved into my first apartment and was in the process of moving in. The door that led into my apartment locks itself automatically when closed. 
So, I was going to the entrance of the apartment complex to get my mail while talking on the phone with my boyfriend. I returned to my apartment and sat on the bed while opening the mail while using the phone. I dropped the phone on the floor and it landed under the bed so I had to lie on the floor and stretch for it. I saw something that caught my eye, there was someone under my bed. My eyes widened and I choked the urge to scream. The person under my bed was lying still with his back towards me and his head to his chest, so I couldn't see his face. And he didn't see me, trying to be rational while so many thoughts rushed through my head, I picked up the phone, said, sorry I dropped my phone, I'm just gonna take a shower and call you back. The bathroom is right by my bed so I hastily walked in, quietly locked the door, turned the shower on, jumped out my window, my apartment is on the first floor, and called the police. They told me to wait nearby, but to go across the street and see if anyone comes out the door to the apartment complex. This was during summer and it was still light out, I placed myself across the street, hiding behind a car while watching my open bathroom window and the entry door. I called my boyfriend and he came to me just before the police. I gave them my keys and they went inside. Only moments later two cops came out holding a thin and tired looking man. His eyes looked crazy, but he didn't try to get away. The policeman that had stood beside me and comforted me while the police searched through my house, I was a mess, shivering and crying, told me that the man stood outside my bathroom door with one of my kitchen knives waiting for me to come out. This man had somehow crept in my entry door while I was getting my mail and hid under the bed, the man that was trying to hurt me turned out to be a homeless person and was placed in a mental hospital. My boyfriend moved in with me the very next day. Thanks for reading. I just wanted to share my story so that others might know what to do if a situation like this occurs. The police told me that what I did was truly amazing and rational, if I had screamed, this could have ended really badly for me. During my early 20s, I worked as a meter reader in Iowa City, Iowa. A meter reader is the person who records how much electricity, gas, or water you've used each month. If your meters are on the inside and you want an accurate bill, a meter reader must enter your home whether you're there to let them in or not. Entering a home when the owner isn't present is something that I never got used to. No matter how loudly I knocked, I never shook the uneasy feeling that I wasn't welcome. The inside of a home is the ultimate private space. A home's exterior is just the image of ourselves that we project to the rest of the world. But the further you venture inside, the closer you come to truly seeing what kind of person lives there. And if you want the raw, unfiltered truth, head for the basement. I hate basements. I've seen walls that looked like giant, static-filled TV screens, until I realized it was roaches scurrying across a white background. Cobwebs so thick and dusty that it looked like the cotton candy machine exploded at the Spider County Fair. I've seen rats, snakes, feces, weapons, neglected children, abused pets, homeless squatters, massive hordes, bizarre sexual items, a makeshift meth lab, and even a coffin. There are rational explanations for all of these things, well, maybe not the coffin, but there was one basement where what I found was beyond the grasp of logic, and that's what made it so terrifying. It was an old apartment house. From the outside, it looked like every other house on the block. I entered the back door and found myself at the top of a staircase. I ran my hand along the wall until it grazed a light switch. I flipped the switch, but no lights turned on. I wasn't carrying a flashlight. A typical route involved five or six hours of walking, so I carried as little as possible. Oftentimes I used the light from my handheld screen, but it only illuminated whatever was about a foot in front of it. So armed with the world's worst lantern, I made my way down into the darkness. Once at the bottom, I blindly shuffled across the room, one baby step at a time. With arms outstretched and head down, I eventually reached the far side of the basement. I shined the dim light from my handheld along the wall, and discovered two doors. Each door led into its own small room. I chose the door on the right, and found the meters in the far corner. As I entered the reeds, I began hearing noises coming from the other room. 
Something was moving, and there was whimpering that grew louder the longer I listened. I eventually realized it was a dog. It sounded weak and distressed. I tried to open the door, but it was locked. At this point, the dog was scratching the other side of the door. I felt helpless. I reported it when I got back to the office, but I couldn't shake the thought of that dog. It stuck with me over the next month, until it was time to return. So there I was, one month later, back within that basement. At least this time I knew where the meters were located. I shuffled back to the little room on the right, while keeping my ears open for any sounds coming from the other room. This time I heard nothing. I read the meters and started making my way back, but I couldn't shake the memory of that dog. Was it still trapped inside that room? My curiosity got the best of me. I stood outside the door for a few moments, listening. Still nothing. That's when I made a huge mistake. I tried to open the door. I had no more than jiggled the doorknob when I first heard it. Screams. Blood-curdling screams, unlike anything I'd ever heard. Sounds that I didn't think a human was capable of producing. Short, piercing, high-pitched shrieks followed abruptly by a low, drawn-out, guttural moan that ultimately morphed into something that I can only describe as crying, but much louder. It was all over the place, like some sort of psychotic, freeform jazz. I stumbled backwards, nearly losing my balance. I shouted something like, hello. Who's in there? There was no response, just screams. Are you okay? Do you need help? Still no response, just screams. There was no doubt that I yelled loud enough for him to hear me. He didn't want my help. He wanted me gone. I fumbled my way through the darkened room, toward the exit. When I reached the top of the stairs, I just stood there, listening. I was trying to wrap my mind around what I was hearing. I waited for the screaming to stop, but it never did. When I finally left, it was still as loud and demented as when it began. I felt relieved, but that quickly vanished when I realized I had to do it all over again next month. I reported what I'd heard, but nothing came of it. As my return drew nearer, a sense of dread grew inside of me. What kind of lunatic sits alone in total darkness and silence? My mind created endless explanations for what kind of hell laid beyond that door. By the time I returned, I'd built him up in my mind so much that anyone other than the devil himself would have been a letdown. But there was no sign of him the next month, or even the next several months. I'd nearly given up on solving the mystery, when a stroke of luck pulled me back in. One night, I went to a concert with my friend Lara. After the show, I gave her a ride home. She'd moved somewhat recently, so she had to give me directions. I didn't pay much attention to where she was leading me, until she pointed to a house a ways up the street. I couldn't believe it. She had moved into the house with the mysterious room in the basement. This sounds weird, but have you noticed anything odd about the basement at this, I began to ask. But before I could finish my sentence, she blurted out, a crazy guy lives down there. Finally, I had confirmation. She went on to tell me that even though her apartment was in the attic, she often heard him yelling late at night. But that wasn't all, she had actually met him. One day, while walking to her car, she saw him standing in the lawn. He stood perfectly still, with no expression on his face. He was directly in her path, so she cautiously made her way around him. She noticed he was staring at her, so she offered a friendly, hi, as she passed. He had no reaction, except for one unsettling exception. He stuck out his tongue, then quickly sucked it back into his mouth and resumed acting like a statue. Thoroughly creeped out, she got in her car and drove away. Two or three months later, I finally met him myself. I entered the back door, like I had so many months before. This time something was different. There was a light on in the basement. I peered down the staircase. At the bottom, a ragged-looking dog was staring back at me. It was the same dog I'd heard during my first visit. Then I noticed something else. 
Behind the dog, I could see a pair of bare feet. The ceiling blocked my view of the rest of whoever was standing there, but it didn't matter. I knew it was him. I should have left right then, but I didn't. I know this probably doesn't make sense, but at this point my desire to finally get some answers outweighed my fear. I shakily called out, meet a reader, and started to make my descent. As I made my way down, more of him was revealed. He looked to be middle-aged. His head was shaved, and his eyes were wild. He was wearing pants, but no shirt. What I remember most was how lean and sinewy his body looked. It had the look of a body that was never at rest. I explained who I was and what I was doing there. To my surprise, not only did he talk to me, but he actually sounded somewhat normal. The volume and pitch of his voice was odd, but he said the same sorts of things that people typically said to meter readers. I even started to doubt whether or not he was the same man I'd heard screaming, but his behavior slowly removed all doubt. As I read the meters, he rapidly paced back and forth. He was constantly wringing his hands together, and spastically cocking his head from side to side. The longer he talked, the more agitated he became. He began grimacing, and little verbal tics started popping up in his speech. Every so often, he'd blurt out a loud A-W-W, in the middle of a sentence. He was trying to suppress these sounds, but he was losing the battle. I started to make my way to the exit. He followed. His verbal outbursts grew louder and more frequent. I was petrified. When I reached the stairs, I drew our conversation to an end and said goodbye. As I turned to head up the staircase, he could no longer hold it in. Screams. The very same unforgettable screams that I'd heard coming from the locked room. I ran up the stairs as fast as my legs would carry me, flung the door open, and rushed back into the daylight. A month or two later, I had a couple friends, including Lara, over to my place. I was excited to tell her about my encounter. But as I was relaying what happened, I could tell that something else was on her mind. When I finished telling my story, she told me about something she'd seen a couple weeks earlier. One day, she noticed lights flashing outside her window. She looked outside just in time to see police officers placing the man from the basement in the back seat of a squad car. She later found out from another tenant that he had attacked someone with a knife. That was the last we ever saw of him. I don't know what became of the man in the basement. I like to think that he got the help he needed, but maybe that's just because I'd rather not think about the alternative.